welcome everybody to the second of a series of five short webinars on privacy enhancing technologies uh, in partnership with the UK's Digital Catapult and um, Professor Nigel Smart. So my name is Jane Leakes and I manage the Newton Gateway to Mathematics, which is the impact initiative of the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Now, I'm sure as many of you know, the Institute is the UK's National Institute for Mathematical Sciences Research Programmes and attracts researchers from all over the world, but currently not at the moment physically because of uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, the Gateway was established in 2013 and basically we're a knowledge intermediary for the mathematical sciences in the UK. And that's all about helping to extend the impact of mathematics to all potential users. So other academic disciplines, business, industry and the public sector. So today's webinar is on fully homomorphic encryption schemes featuring Rand Hindi from Zama and Nigel Smart from K. Leuven. So before we kick off, my colleague Rob Learning of the Digital Catapult would just like to say a few words. Thank you very much, Jean, and thank uh, Jane, and thank you again for having me here. Um, so uh, we are extremely interested in this event, which is why we're co-hosting, uh, co, co um uh, aligning with it. Uh, Digital Catapult is a neutral, not-for-profit organisation originally created by the UK government alongside eight other catapult organisations. Uh, we particularly focus in digital technologies and how digital can be applied to improve the UK economy. Um, so we look at areas such as 5G technology, Internet of Things, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning and distributed systems. Um, we are extremely interested in getting companies to use their better, use their data better. And companies all, always talk about wanting to learn from data or improve data or, uh, you know, generate money from their data or capture new insights. But the problem is that you often find that the best comes uh, the best value comes when you actually mix the data with someone else. So you take your data and then you learn from someone else's data and you compare or do whatever you want with it. But at the moment, there's a lot of fear and uh, uncertainty, doubt within industry about how you best uh, use that data across organizational boundaries. And so I, uh, I'm really pleased to see that we have two excellent speakers, Nigel and Rand, about to take us into the world of fully homomorphic encryption, which is mind blowing technology uh, and can hopefully help companies get some value out of their data and encourage new data sharing. So uh, without further ado, Nigel, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. So if you didn't know, this is the second of five events that we're organizing. The first one was with Van Vogt Danoff. And if you missed that, look at the Newton Gateway website. Um, just like last time, um, we got about 300, uh, well over 300 people registered, of which I currently see there's 112 of you here. To give you an idea of the type of organisations, because um, you can't see who you're sitting next to, because it's a virtual event, and we've got people here from companies as diverse as Snapchat, Honda, Privitar, Tesco, the Bank of England, um, Coa Duke, which I've never heard of, SAP, Envale, and all sorts of other different organisations from around the world. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, last week we talked about multi-party computation, which is kind of one way of computing on encrypted data. But probably the most famous way, um, it's certainly if you read technolog technological press of computing on encrypted data, is fully homomorphic encryption. So we're really um, pleased to have um, the CEO of a company from uh, Paris called Zama, Rand Hindi here. And he is going to, um, he's going to talk to us through, he's kind of like a privacy expert, like a privacy guru in France, one could say. So he's actually going to tell us a little bit about himself, about the SAMA, and then we're going to have a chat. Now, if you've got questions, please post them in the Q&A section on the Zoom app. Just use the chat for chatting because I can't manage two window, three windows at a time. So if you've got a question, put it in Q&A and anything else, put it in chat. So if you want to talk to the uh, the organisers or anything, just put it in chat. If you've got a Q&A, put it in the Q&A. So Rand, tell us about yourself. How did you get into, what's your background? Why, why are you so interested in privacy? Um, so, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been an engineer my whole life. Uh, started coding when I was a kid and... Uh, when I was 14, that was in the 90s, I uh, created a social network. And uh, 
one of the things that struck me is the fact that I could read literally people's messages that they would send each other on the social platform. And something felt really, really wrong about that. Uh, when I went to study at UCL, I got into machine learning my first year in college, did a PhD in bioinformatics. And so, you know, as soon as you start playing around with genetic data and machine learning, it becomes pretty obvious that the intersection of privacy and machine learning is extremely important. And uh, I've done my whole career around that. Uh, started a company uh, called Snips a few years ago where we built a private by design voice assistant. That company got acquired last year and uh, now have been working on my new startup, Zama, with uh, Pascal Payet around, oh, hey, doggy, around uh, homomorphic <laughs> encryption for machine learning. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, people, people often underestimate the importance of privacy, right? And, uh, and many people say that, uh, you know, nobody cares about privacy. Well, my goal is that indeed nobody does care, but not because it's not important, but rather because it became part of the normal way of doing computing. Cool. Um, so, you see, from Zama, and it's based on this technology called fully homomorphic encryption. Can you explain what that is? What, what, how does that differ from what we heard last week about MPC? What's the, the kind of different ways you would use it? The best way that I can explain homomorphic encryption is that it enables you to compute on encrypted data without ever having to decrypt it. Mm -hmm. So imagine I'm a, I'm a user of some kind of online service in the cloud. Uh, I could be a consumer using an app. I could be a company using some kind of API. It doesn't really matter. I would encrypt my data on my side, send my encrypted data to the service provider. They wouldn't have any way of decrypting it, right? But the way it's been encrypted enables you to manipulate it mathematically, so to compute on it, produce a result which itself is encrypted, send it back to the user who can decrypt it. From my perspective as a user, exactly the same service, sending data, getting a response, but now the data is not only encrypted in transit, it's also encrypted during processing. So, if, you know, I think homomorphic encryption can be taught of end-to-end -end encryption where you can manipulate the data in the middle, effectively. Okay, so I, I, so I take my data and I send it to the cloud. Why, don't, why doesn't the cloud send me the algorithm? What, what's the advantage of, of sending it to the cloud? Because surely there's the cost, you know, FHG is not for free, so, what you know? What is there a cost trade-off in terms of them sending me the algorithm versus me sending them the data? Well, when you think about it, the algorithm, or in the case of machine learning, the model that you've trained is IP, intellectual property. So it might not be desirable to actually push it to the end user. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, this is a very common problem with on-prem deployment of services or with edge computing. Uh, a lot of companies are trying to find ways to obfuscate the actual algorithms when it's running on the edge, precisely so that they can protect the core IP and prevent reverse engineering. Uh, the beautiful thing about, you know, the homomorphic encryption is that you as a company don't have to worry about people seeing the internals of how the machine works. And at the same time, it makes it easier for you to update the algorithm itself because, well, there is only one source that the data is going through. Okay, so let's kind of drill down to these use cases a bit more. So if you, um, so if I encrypt my data and I send it to the cloud and this cloud applies some machine learning algorithm, but what happens if the cloud itself wants to learn the output of this algorithm? Because it's not always the case that this, it's useful to the user. It could be useful um, to the cloud. For example, if I'm doing, uh, if I'm doing machine learning for virus detection, if I've detect, if I've got a virus on my computer and I'm reporting this to the cloud, the cloud actually wants to update its algorithm. It wants to kind of inform other users. So how do you right. solve that problem? Um, in theory, you could solve that with something like <clears throat> multi-key <clears throat> homomorphic encryption, okay. uh, which is not really something that we know how to do well today. So I think right now you wouldn't use homomorphic encryption as a replacement for every other privacy preserving technologies. Okay. Uh, what I would typically recommend is if you're trying to train the model on sensitive data, it's better that you use MPC, multi-party computation, federated learning, differential privacy, all of which are methods which are being you know, used for training. Homomorphic encryption comes at the inference level, right? Okay. So once you've trained the model, 
and you need to securely process data at inference time, you then use homomorphic completion. So in your chain of private machine learning, you would use some techniques like federated learning to train, then convert the model to a homomorphically encrypted model, and then process the inference data homomorphically. Cool. Um, so that's really clear. So what use cases, you know, can you give some examples of, of, of verticals or horizontal industries where people, so, so people in the audience can fix where they think this is going to be applied? Um, so, okay, so that's a pretty tricky question. <laughs> I mean, in, in theory, not actually in practice, yeah? So let's just say, in theory, how would you, you know, give a, a, a use case well, to see? So in theory, you know, we can all imagine that uh, healthcare companies and finance companies and all of these traditional industries that we think of as being very sensitive in terms of data security are potential good users for homomorphic encryption. Uh, however, what's interesting is that when you look at the landscape of private machine learning, what you realize is that everybody's been addressing those same verticals and customers, but none of them has put anything in production yet, right? It seems like everybody's just doing a bunch of POCs. And so what that tells me as an entrepreneur is that these are not the right initial use cases to go after. Maybe they're too complicated, they're too big, or the customers themselves are just not <clears throat> comfortable adopting these technologies fast enough. Um, so I think that the short answer is we don't know yet what the killer use cases are in 2020, 2021 for homomorphic encryption, uh, even though we have a pretty good idea how widely applicable it can be in the future. So I know I'm a little bit like uh, dodging the question, but it's on purpose because it's very, very dangerous when you're in a very innovative space to try and have a top-down approach at guessing who might be the user. I think in that particular case, we're much better off trying to have a bottom-up approach, just putting the technology out there and actually seeing what people build with it, because that will tell you who really needs it. Okay. And you might be surprised. It might not be who you think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's cool. So, okay, so we've kind of established that FHE is not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve all problems. And it you should be combined with other forms of privacy preserving technology that we're discussing in these in these things. Okay, so you clearly never have a free lunch. Okay, so what's the you know what's the computational? I'm not going to say efficiency of homomorphic encryption. I'm going to say what's the computational inefficiency of homomorphic encryption? Why why how is it going to cost me if I use it? So homomorphic encryption is not a new idea, right? I mean, it's, I, I think the first homomorphism was with RSA. So, you know, like 50 years ago or something, okay. a while ago. Um, and people ever since have been trying to figure out whether you could do fully homomorphic encryption, meaning that you could have some Turing completeness in homomorphic encryption. Uh, the first time someone found out, you know, Gentry in, the, in 2009, it was a big breakthrough. Uh, I remember that even my co-founder Pascal uh, at some point thought it was not even possible at all, right? <laughs> um, but it was extremely slow. It, it, I think at the time it took half an hour to basically multiply two bits, uh, which, you know, <laughs> arguably is, is not very useful. And we've come a long way since, uh, but the current schemes when it comes to machine learning are still pretty much a million times slower than doing the same thing non-encrypted. So if you're taking like a machine learning uh, inference and you want to do it with homomorphic encryption, it's going to be a million times slower. So, you know, good idea, but uh, if you have to wait 11 days for something that will usually take you a second, it's not exactly very useful. Um, what's been happening over the past 12 months is that there was a series of breakthroughs, including some that we had at Zama, that now enables us to go much faster than what's been possible up until a year ago. Cool. And we're now, yeah, and so we're now entering a new phase of you know, homomorphic encryption where we're starting to see acceptable latencies. We're still talking you know, multi-second latencies, but we're no longer talking minutes or hours as it used to be the case before. Okay, so, so the academics are kind of cheated in this space. I one of them, okay, is that they didn't measure latency, they measured average throughput. So right. yes. do you see that as, I mean, do you see, I mean, so the, uh, initially early on, you know, we had a lot of things is we can reach a very, very high throughput with FHE because you've got all this packing you can do. Um, do you see use cases for that or is it really, is it pure latency as the issue? 
uh, you're pointing to something that I think is fundamental. There is no common benchmark for homomorphic encryption, even less so for homomorphic machine learning. And everybody kind of like cherry picks the results they want to show. And indeed, a lot of people are showing amortized uh, times, meaning that you take a whole bunch of uh, uh, inputs and you process them basically packed in, as a batch. And you, you know, you see on average, how long did it take you to do that? I think that's cheating because when you think about the canonical case of a user using some online service, you're not gonna be waiting for a thousand of them to be in the queue, right? You wanna process them as they come in, meaning that the real measure should be latency for a single prediction and not amortize over like 10,000 ones. Cool. And when you look at that, what you realize is that performances are really not that good uh, on the latency level, even though the throughput might be acceptable with packing. Okay, so, so you're a startup. Um, so we've got to read up the, the questions that are coming in now. It's really kind of cool. We haven't even started our list of standard questions. I know there's more interesting ones than I've thought of. Um, so someone's talked about... Um, Okay. Oh, oh my God, there's too many good ones, right? So I'm going to, <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to talk about first is machine learning. We've already talked about machine learning. So there's lots of different machine learning frameworks out there. You've got TensorFlow. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, neural networks. We have, you know, generalized linear models, you know, just basically advanced statistics, just advanced statistics. I've just insulted all the statisticians. I do apologize. Um, and, you know, uh, there it was loads of machine learning. Models. So what are the best machine learning frameworks for use with in homomorphic encryption? Um, I think the framework that you use for training isn't really what matters because the way that you would use homomorphic encryption at inference time is you would take your train model, whether it's in, you know, uh, ONNX or any other output format that you can save it in, it doesn't really matter. And then you would pass it through what's called a homomorphic compiler. This compiler would convert all of the plain text operations into a homomorphic equivalent so that you can then basically run that homomorphically. So if you want the abstraction level, there is a compiler, a homomorphic runtime, and then all of that runs on top of some kind of homomorphic encryption library, which is completely agnostic to machine learning itself. Okay. Um, so, you know, I would say that it's not TensorFlow or PyTorch that matters, it's the homomorphic framework itself that matters. And uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, obviously I'm gonna be talking about Zama here. Uh, so we just open sourced a homomorphic encryption library called Concrete, uh, which implements uh, all of the stuff that we've invented so far, which is particularly good for machine learning. And we will be open sourcing a compiler and uh, a neural network runtime in March, around March. Q Q okay. Q Q <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um... So uh, are the big companies interested in this by the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, and the Apples? I mean, do they have work going on in FHE or is it really the, the space of startups? Of course. And uh, you, have, you have to think a little bit about why would a big cloud player be interested in FHE? Uh, there are two answers to that. First, because a lot of their big customers are very sensitive about data security and want better guarantees. You know, think about Microsoft, Azure, that won you know, the Jedi cloud deal with a DoD in the US. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to offer some kind of hardened security for their infrastructure. So they're investing massively in you know, PSI, MPC, FHE, all of those privacy preserving technologies. But where I think there is a real huge opportunity is that when you think about it, the biggest cost to companies today when it comes to privacy is data localization. The fact that you need to process data where data came from means that you need to pay for the cloud resources locally. And those resources can vary dramatically in price between a region and another. So if you're computing in Europe, it could be twice as, more as expensive as if you're doing it in the US. And if you could compute in Chinese data center, it could be a tenth of the price of what you've got in the US. Um, with homomorphic encryption and secure computation in general, you could, in theory, no longer have to worry about where the data is being processed because, well, you know, who cares if it goes to the US? The NSA wouldn't be able to break the encryption anyway. And if you start thinking about it this way and you no longer need data localization, then you can save massively on cloud computing by using whatever is the cheapest available resource at any given time. 
So like, I think that this is why this is so fundamental. Right, so we've got, we've got some more ones, so we could tease apart uh, some of the questions uh, you've all, we've already answered. Um, so we talked about FHG and MPC, and you said that MPC would be probably good for um, doing the, the learning, and the FHG would be probably better in some use cases for doing the inference. Is there any use case you see where they're kind of they, they're both kind of usable, and they're just like different implementation trade-offs? So I just question from you. I wanted to kind of distinguish them in their head. So, sorry, can you say that again? I didn't hear. So, it, so there's a question from the audience. Wanted to distinguish FHE and MPC in the head. We've had a, a case where oh, right. they're different, but is there any case where you see where they work together or they're both equally applicable? Uh, yeah, probably. I think so. I, I like to think about FHE again as a as a building block of a broader pre privacy preserving, you know, computation platform of some sort. And uh, not everything that you can do with uh, FHE, you can do it with MPC and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think it really depends on the use case. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, as I said, FHE is really good for a single key setup uh, where you've got a server communicating with a client. So the advantage of FHE is that it doesn't require changing the paradigm of how you build your infrastructure. There is a server answering to a client. You've now just encrypted data in between the two. That's it. So it's just not there. So that's the reason why FHG is not very good for learning, because in learning, you want to put many clients' data together. Is that right? To, as of today, FHG is not very good at combining data that came from sources with that are not sharing the same encryption key. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, there are, you know, you could design protocols where, you know, you could have some sort of like a middle hub uh, but then you're making assumptions of security and, 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 and trust, right? Yeah. Like any of those systems, even in MPC, you're still assuming that there isn't collusion, right? Uh, I mean, you're hoping. Okay, still, still keeping with the end of list of questions coming in. Um, oh, is this from Agent, the Agent Baldwin I know? Hello, Agent, if you're the Agent I knew from Bristol. Maybe you're not, I don't know. But anyway, hello, Agent. Um, and she's got a question, which I think is going up. So when you talk about computational efficiency for FHE, Oh, do you mean on a standard CPU? Can you use GPUs? Are you going to use special hardware? How is, what's the architecture in terms of computers going to be here to use this? Um, right now, we're doing FHE on CPUs, uh, but it's pretty obvious that things are going to change in the future. Uh, because when you think about it, a CPU is kind of not really efficient when it comes to high performance mathematical computing, especially when the, the mathematical operations you want to perform are so narrow in terms of, you know, uh, diverseness, right? Um, and so definitely both the cost and the speed of a CPU for homomorphic encryption is, is not that good. It's not a good trade off. Okay. Um, so moving to GPUs is one first good step. But where you're probably going to get most of the acceleration is by eventually moving to FPGAs and ASICs. Uh, so I, I could totally foresee in the next few years having dedicated FHE accelerators uh, the same way we've got dedicated machine learning accelerators. Uh, and uh, I can bet that pretty much every big cloud provider will be offering homomorphic encryption instances to facilitate this kind of processing. And in fact, actually, we have uh, DARPA, the US agency has just invested a few tens of millions in actually building hardware accelerators. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions, which are, I know what the answer is going to be to the questions. So what I want to do is actually put the, uh, put the groundwork for these answers, because we haven't, we've got to be a little bit technical. So something that you do in SAMA, which is that you use this system called TFHE, which is there's different M uh, FHE schemes and you use something called TFHE. Now TFHE is kind of weird in that it does something special in the, in the operation called bootstrapping. So to be able to answer a lot of the other questions that people are coming up with, we need to touch on what is bootstrapping and why does TFHE's approach to bootstrapping enable, for example, evaluating a complex function such as a sine or a cosine or something that's kind of a bit more complex than just addition and multiplication. So in two or three minutes, explain what bootstrapping is and why it's important. That's putting you on the spot right. a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, whenever you're computing uh, on data homomorphically, uh, in order to guarantee a certain level of security, there is random noise that's added to the data. 
So try to imagine that, you know, this is your container of data. Uh, the first half will be the actual data. The second half will be random noise. The problem is that every time you're manipulating this data, this noise is growing, growing, growing. And over time, it basically starts eating up some of the data itself. And if you let that happen too much and you try to decrypt, you're basically just decrypting random noise. And so at that point, you know, you've really not been doing much useful. Right? It's very secure, but not very useful. Not very useful in the case of what we're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. So to prevent that, uh, what people do is a special operation called bootstrapping, which basically resets this noise level to its initial uh, 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 level, right? So let's say that this is your container. You operate, 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 operate. Ooh, too much noise. I'm starting to eat the data. Stop, bootstrap, goes back to the beginning, and then you can keep on going. And in fact, this bootstrapping procedure is what enables fully homomorphic encryption in the sense that you can keep on computing forever. Uh, the problem with bootstrapping is that it's, been ex it's extremely slow. So it actually, when people say that homomorphic encryption is slow, it's not because of the homomorphic operations themselves, it's because of the need for bootstrapping on a regular basis. So the more often you bootstrap, the slower the computation is gonna be overall. And there are two ways that people have been trying to fix that. Either make bootstrapping faster or try to do more operations before you actually have to bootstrap. Uh, in practice, what we end up doing is a bit of both. So try to make bootstrapping faster and try to do it as less, as, as, as uh, not often as possible. And so TFHE is interesting because it, it basically has a very fast bootstrapping procedure, which basically just takes, you know, 10 milliseconds, 13 milliseconds or something. Uh, compared to the other bootstrapping operation and other schemes, which can be multiple tens of seconds, sometimes even worse than that. Um, so what we, sorry, do you want to say something about that? No, 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 keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah, I'm just making sure I've got the right questions lined up. So, so I, I know there's a lot of things to, to, to yeah. keep in mind here, but, but think about it this way. Uh, every time you do too many operations, you need to bootstrap. Now, if I've got some complicated function, it doesn't have to be a mathematical function, right? It could be some random operation on the data. It could be a random lambda in Python or something, right? The only way that I have of computing that function would be to decompose it into some kind of Boolean or arithmetic circuit. And after every basically multiplication in that circuit, you need to do a bootstrap. Mm -hmm. The more complicated a function, the more complicated the circuit, and the more bootstrapping needs to be done. So what we have invented at Zama, well, not invented, but what we have implemented successfully, right, is something called programmable bootstrapping, which means that you can basically program a function of arbitrary complexity to be executed at the same time as you're bootstrapping itself. So you're taking noisy data, it goes through this program, program bootstrap, and what comes out is a clean encryption of f of x. So basically, you're getting the result of the function applied on encrypted data for the cost of a single bootstrap instead of like doing it through a complicated circuit. So that allows you to do complex, what we would call complex operations, like for example, uh, uh, highly nonlinear functions, which are like sine, cosine or the value functions that are used in, in neural networks and things exactly. like that. Exactly, so, so in neural networks, this is really important because the way that a network learns is by learning nonlinear mappings, basically. And yeah. that requires something called an activation function. So every neuron basically has to go through a complex mathematical function. Actually, it's a fairly simple mathematical function, but it's very difficult to do homomorphically because it's nonlinear by nature. Uh, Prior to programmable bootstrapping, the only way to compute those activation functions was either through an expensive circuit or through some kind of very crude approximation. So there was a trade-off between speed and accuracy of computing that function. With programmable bootstrapping, it's pretty much no longer an issue because all you do is you program the activation function and every neuron does a bootstrapping operation and basically applies the function. And a nice side effect of this is that the data is always clean, which means that you can keep going as deep as you want. There is no more accumulation of noise layer after layer, which prevents you from going beyond, you know, a dozen layers. 
Okay, so that now we now we've set the groundwork. I can now ask the questions that everyone wanted to ask. And actually, what you just said, um, you said is that in the old days before program bootstrapping, is that you had this uh, trade off between accuracy and the time. So now you don't have the time because it's all just done in one step. But how accurate can you be? You know, how accurate can you compute the sine function or the relative function or whatever? Um, so that's. Uh parameter basically. So you can decide how, how precise you want it to be. Uh, and that depends on, they'll have an impact on runtime, of course. But when it comes to machine learning, what's interesting is that the better trained the model, the more resilient it is to a loss of accuracy potentially, right? Because by definition, a robustly trained model will be resilient to noise and losing accuracy is pretty much the same as adding noise, right? You're basically just losing information. Um, so what we've seen is that in very well-trained networks, even after 50 or 60 layers, you basically do not lose accuracy after a homomorphic uh, conversion, basically. Uh, we're still having some issue with very, very deep networks, like 100 layers and more. But even then, you know, we have roughly a five-point accuracy drop. So, you know, you go from 95 to 90. Uh, so not very good in terms of machine learning standard, but not that bad considering that this is literally the first time anyone's even been able to do a hundred layers. Okay. So, um, so we touched on machine learning and we touched on how the programmable bootstrapping kind of allows us to do more complicated things like a deep neural network or whatever. Um, and now, one of the things is that, that people have is that they have a big database and they don't actually run the machine learning algorithm or anything on the big database is that they actually have to first do a select in SQL terms, a select or a join operation. Can FHE help with that or do we, or is this another case where we can apply other technologies to do the data extraction from a database before we then apply an FHE into it? Um, I haven't started looking too much into FA, like homomorphic databases. It's something that we feel that we can address with, uh, with the same technologies. Right now, we're really focused, at Zama at least, we're focusing on numerical computations, right? Mm -hmm. So machine learning, data science in general. Uh, the way that I see things evolving in the future, however, is that the same way that you've got a compiler that converts your plain text neural network into a homomorphic equivalent, it's very likely you're going to have a compiler for your database that converts your you know, SQL query into a homomorphic SQL query or something similar. Uh, how exactly that would work, I'm not sure, uh, but it's definitely something we're interested in long term. And uh, if people are working on you know, homomorphic databases, uh, there is definitely some room for collaboration, but uh, um, I, I'm, I can't give you any more on that yet. Cool. Okay. So we've got We'll leave the techie stuff to the side for a minute. I know there's loads of techie questions are coming up, but we're going to leave that aside for a second. Concentrate more on 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 the business and the and you know how this could be used by users, etc. So the first thing is that it would seem that you know well this is the same question I asked Dan last week. How do you avoid being a POC factory? How do you avoid actually having a product that is repeatable? and can be, you know, you get repeatable sales and therefore a hockey stick and then you exit for a billion, yeah? So it's clearly what, you, what, because it would seem that, you know, like every time you go to engage with a customer, you're going to have to understand their use case, da, da, da. How can you stop being a POC factory and actually have something that's a real product that arbitrary people can use just by just signing up, paying you something and not having to interact with your engineers that much? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll share an anecdote about my previous company. Uh, which, uh, which gave me a lot of insights to that question. Um, you know, before I got into homomorphic encryption, when I was in machine learning purely, we had the same issue. Most machine learning companies were just basically glorified consulting companies, right? Uh, and that always sort of troubled me because I was like, well, does that mean there is no product or no market for a product that all people want or like custom built solutions and basically an army of data scientists doing stuff for them? Uh, so when we had, so just to explain a bit what we used to do before, in my previous company, we had a, a voice assistant that we sold as a B2B solution, and it was running completely on the edge. Uh, so nothing was going to the cloud. Uh, initially, we did like most B2B company, 
we went after the biggest customers we could think of, uh, you know, telecom operators and the big, uh, you know, consumer IoT companies and be like, hey, you can now basically have an embedded voice assistant that doesn't need an internet connectivity and blah, blah, blah. And everybody, everybody was interested and we did a bunch of POCs but only roughly 5% of those POCs converted into actual uh, contracts and deployment in production. And that got me thinking, hmm, I've got half of my company working in those POCs. It's taking us like six to eight months. It makes our sales cycle 14 months long, right? That doesn't look like a very good investment, right? If you ask me, having half of your company for a 5% conversion rate that takes two eight months is, is not a very good formula. <laughs> what we had done at the same time is we had made our technology available for free to any developer who wanted to experiment. And in two years, we had grown our developer community from zero to 40,000 developers. So there's a huge interest from the broader developer community. What we found, and that was really interesting, is that roughly 10% of those developers were evaluating the technology for a commercial product. And when they got convinced by the POCs they did themselves and they would reach out to us, they wouldn't need a POC. So you would yeah. skip those first eight months and you would go straight into talking about pricing and all these things. So the conversion rate was through the roof because those leads were extremely highly qualified the sales cycle shortened from 14 to, you know, a few months, basically. And we found out use cases that we could not even think of because most of these companies were not, you know, the blue chip, huge, you know, million dollar contract, you know, but you had 20 of them. Mm -hmm. And it was a very low touch sales model. They barely needed us to do anything for them. And that got me thinking, you know, if I had done that from the beginning, instead of spending so much precious resources doing useless POCs, right? I could have done maybe 5X the revenue and my company would have been acquired for even more money potentially, <laughs> right? So what we did at Zama is we're like, you know what? We have no idea who wants to use FHE right now. Let's be honest, right? Because nobody ever had something they could use in the first place. And we still need about a year to get the product to a level that it could be used completely self-service. Well, let's just like put it out in the open in the meantime and just see what people build. So our approach at Zama now is 100% open source. The company is built from the ground up to be open source specifically so that we do zero POCs. Cool. And so um, anyone out in the audience there can actually download your software and just use it and, and play and make their own POCs. Exactly, exactly. So, so to be clear, you know, I'm also investing quite a bit now. And when I see a company that comes to me and says, I've got 20 customers, I'm like, great, amazing traction. How many of them, how many of them are in productions and how many are POCs? Yeah, yeah. If the answer is, oh, I've got like, you know, 20 POCs and zero in production, which is basically the case in homomorphic encryption, by the way. Uh, what I think is, okay, so you're just basically showing me a vanity metric. Uh, you know, does the same thing as me telling you I've got a 10,000 Twitter follower that does not correlate with revenue whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. So what do you perceive as being the major difficulties in deploying uh, homomorphic encryption in production? You know, where, so if, if I'm a company, just suppose someone's listening here and they've got some engineers, they download, download your library, they do a little POC and it kind of, they think, yeah, this is going to kind of work. Now they're kind of a little bit more positive. What are the things they're going to have to watch out of going to be the things that are going to trip them over from turning from, yeah, we've got an idea with the POC that works through to actually this is deployed in production. Um, so my short answer is they shouldn't never have to worry about that at all. Uh, if you're trying to manipulate homomorphic encryption at the crypto level using our crypto library, you need, a, you need to be a cryptographer, right? There's so many things you need to think about, you know, noise management, uh, precision. Uh, it, it, honestly, it's, it's horrendously complicated. So that's why we believe very strongly in creating a layer on top of the crypto library, which automates the process of converting from you know, a plain text program into a homomorphic equivalent and optimizing the cryptographic parameters so that you don't need a PhD in cryptography to do it. So, so I think you know, if you wanna do something completely custom for which we don't have a solution, you can use a crypto library, but then you have to be a cryptographer. 
if you want to use it for machine learning, you don't have to know anything about cryptography because the compiler is what does the conversion for you. The compiler is basically an automated homomorphization yeah, yeah. of you know, your use case. And so the more compilers, the less people need to do things by hand. Okay, so the um, what what so that's the kind of like I've got my application and I've got my compiler builds my application. But crypto is more than that. In that, once you actually start deploying it in production, you've got to worry about where are the keys, who makes the keys, where they get deployed. You know, what, you know, uh, where do you know what's the infrastructure I'm running this on? You know, it's all the non crypto stuff is actually right. just a big problem. So where do you see the problems yeah. there? That's a beautiful thing about homomorphic encryption, and at least the way that we were thinking about this is uh, we are building uh, our solution in a way that it integrates natively into you know, traditional microservice type infrastructure. Okay. The compiler is just a microservice. So you launch it on AWS, Azure, it doesn't matter. You just push it through model once you've trained it. It compiles it. That then gets pushed to the runtime, which itself is a microservice. There is nothing for it to worry. And that just has a web API, an HTTP API that you just send data to and get it back from. And on the client, you just have an SDK that does encryption, decryption, and key generation, and you're done. There is no key management on our side. I mean, you know, you need to upload like a public key, but that's not so much of an issue, right? There is no private key we need to manage for you. And there is no infrastructure that is specific to what we do that you need to worry about. Okay. Um, Rob, do you want to ask some questions or are you, you happy? Yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks. Um, really great listening to uh, the business side of your work here, Rand, as well. Uh, interested to hear that you, you, so you're opening things up to get uh, grassroots interest in the technologies that you're building. And then those grassroots elements come back and convert into sales. Do you, do you know what they're doing inside their businesses to translate between, um, you know, so they're obviously geeks or deeply knowledgeable people like you know uh, uh like the average cryptographer um but of course the person making the buying decision is not you know a, a cryptographer they're going to be a, a ceo a standard you know business person how do they do that internal translation of actually what this guy's got here is really cool and look at this poc do you do you get involved in those conversations at all so I, again, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I guess my, my contrary view on that is that developers are the real influencers when it comes to technology purchase decisions. I think that, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it wasn't the case, uh, especially because open source was considered to be the, less, the lesser version of closed source software. Yeah. But this is no longer the case. I think today we consider open source to be equally... Uh, viable alternatives, and in some cases, like cryptography, even better because of, you know, Kershaw principle, right? Uh, security about security, not a good idea. Um, so I think, you know, that this is changing. I think developers are the, uh, you know, are the hidden influencers of technology adoption. And if a developer does not want to use that technology, I can guarantee you that their manager is going to feel it, right? And similarly, if a developer does like a technology because you know, the documentation is clean, the APIs are clean, it's easy to use, like, you know, it's just like, it's a pleasure to code it, right? Guess what they're gonna be recommending when they have at some point a conversation about which technology to use. They're I think this will be music to the ears of lots of our audience here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, like, I think it's, it's, now is the time I think the developers can really influence technology decisions. The CEOs, they, I mean, I'm, C I'm the CEO of my company, right? But I'm, I'm also a developer. <laughs> but non-developer CEOs, there are too many things they have to keep up with, right? And so, and so I think, you know, it's, 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 if you've got developers on board, you've got the managers and the buyers eventually. There's, a, there's an additional question back to the original point of you opening this up, letting people see it, letting people play with it. And then they come back and those convert to sales. I suspect there's a lot of fear about opening things up in that people just take it and run with it. What makes them come back? Why don't they just do it in secret and not tell you that they're using your stuff? Uh, you know, is there secret source? Is there a service plus model? What's the, is there a, yes. another element there? So, so one of the biggest fallacies in, in uh, you know, open source is to believe that just because it's open, there is nothing you can monetize. 
that is incorrect. Uh, you know, we've got countless companies making hundreds of millions in revenue with an open source model. Uh, Elasticsearch, uh, MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, uh, Spark, right? These are huge companies now and you could use everything off the shelf. So the way that you do this is usually through a combination of four different uh, business models. Um, the first one is you can offer premium support, you know, the Red Hat model. Uh, it's open source, but you're kind of like having trouble or like, you know, maybe it's not that easy to integrate. You can basically sell, you know, services on top of it. Uh, useful, not very scalable. Uh, the second model is offer hosting services. You know, you can use the open source version and host it yourself, or, you know, you can use my hosted version and not have to worry about it. That's something that works pretty well, especially at the moment. The other two are also quite interesting. Uh, one, which is called the open core model. You basically open source the core engine and you sell closed source premium enterprise features. So in the case of homomorphic encryption, maybe, you know, the ASIC is something that is not open source, right? Uh, you know, if someone wants to use ASIC acceleration, they can just purchase the actual ASIC from you, for example, right? And the final one, which is my favorite, is, uh, <laughs> is, is it basically called the dual licensing model. When you open source your product, uh, you've got a choice of which license to use. You know, are you going to use an Apache MIT license or are you going to use a GPL type of license? The GPL type of license forces you to make your own code open source under GPL if you want to integrate the code base into something you distribute. As long as you keep it internally for prototyping, it's fine. But as long as soon as you give it to someone else, you have to open source your own code. So naturally, companies hate that. You know, Google, for example, has a policy of zero contribution to a GPL open source projects. Right? That's how much they hate it. Well, you just sell the exact same code under another license. <laughs> so you're not basically monetizing the code and software, that's free. You're monetizing the legal implication of using the open source version. Smart, very smart. Right. <laughs> kind of cool one, yeah? Cool it's one. kind of interesting, it's a bit similar to, um, it's a crypto patent. So you never patent the crypto, you patent the application and the, and the implementation. Yeah. yeah, the patent, the, the crypto is always free, you know, freely available. And then you patent everything else. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's a very similar kind of idea. Exactly. So, um, so we've got some inter interesting things in, in uh, questions again. And I'm not going to get to, I have to look at um, these uh, uh, a bit later on. Um, so what about GDPR? So do you think, I mean, uh, you talk to, a, you're not a lawyer. I mean, you talk to lawyers, they've all got a different view of GDPR. So what is your opinion? And remember, you're not a lawyer, so no one can take it. So no one can take this as in the court of law. So what is your opinion in that if you encrypt the data with HE, then you're going to be GDPR compliant and you can send the data wherever you want on the planet and compute on it wherever you want? Um, <clears throat> so the GDPR has, you know, stuff around encryption, but it never actually considered homomorphic encryption, right? It was considered that the service you're sending the encrypted data to has the decryption key. And therefore, the fact that it's encrypted doesn't really make much of a difference in terms of access to personal data. Mm -hmm. When it comes to homomorphic encryption, things are a little bit different because now the data is encrypted end to end. The end user is the only one with the ability to decrypt the data and the results. Um, arguably, you know, you still have metadata, right? Uh, there is still potentially an identity. There's an IP address. So you're probably still going to need consent <clears throat> to uh, get this data. What I think is no longer necessary is data localization provisions. Uh, which I think is really what needs to evolve in GDPR. Baselist says, well, if the data is encrypted end to end, then who cares where it goes for processing, right? I mean, like, you know, uh, homomorphic encryption is post quantum, right? It, it's, it's literally like even a quantum computer can't break it. So why would you have to worry about, you know, incompatible surveillance laws, which is a, which is a reason, by the way, for this data localization provision in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think every couple of years, they're revisiting the GDPR uh, to see what's like, you know, the mother interpretation. Uh, so I'm definitely hoping that homomorphic encryption is going to make the cuts very soon. And that, yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be acceptable for a company to use a Chinese data center for homomorphically processing data. Okay, so I've got, so let's look back. back. So let's look at um, the use cases again that we've been talking about, which is mainly some sort of model in the cloud and then user text data sends it to the cloud and gets the result back. How does the user know the cloud hasn't lied? 
How does uh, the user know that the cloud has actually applied the algorithm? Is, is there a way of doing that or, or do we just have to trust the cloud? Uh, so so the, the, <laughs> well, the first obvious answer to that is, you know, the answer you're getting is completely bogus. You know, something wrong happened. <laughs> uh, but I'd say the more crypto answer, which I think is, is, is what I'm excited about long-term, is uh, combining homomorphic encryption with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, basically, you would use, you know, zero knowledge proofs as a way for the cloud to guarantee that it did what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And you would use homomorphic encryption as a way for the cloud to not know what it's supposed to have done that is that it done on which data, basically. Okay, I'm now disappointed because I should have asked that question as the last one, because that would lead into the next um, interview we're doing with Eli Ben Sasson on uh, it's okay, a different, so. So, <laughs> yeah, so, okay. so that's a great advert for the next meeting. Great, cool. But this is really important, right? Because you know, if you combine zero knowledge proofs with homomorphic encryption, then you can start considering public cloud computing because now you no longer have to trust that device in terms of privacy, and neither do you have to trust it in terms of executing the right computation. Yeah. And now you can just add a layer of blockchain for payments and then you're done. And you <laughs> publicly distributed AWS. That's a tenth of the price. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, okay, so again, what we, what we talked about is um, we had a user sending data to the cloud and the cloud apply, essentially what, what, what we're imagining here is the cloud applies, it has a, a machine learning model that it knows in the clear and it is applying that machine learning model to encrypted data. So we have one party has the algorithm, which is clear, and the data is encrypted. But you could imagine it the other way around, is that you actually have an encrypted model. Um, do you see that as an application, or is that actually is that harder to do? If you so, if I took a neural network and I take the model is itself secret and the data is public, is that just as easy, or just or is it harder? Or what, what, what's what's the difference here? Uh, you could do that for sure. Uh, you know, you, you could encrypt the weights of the model. So the, the architecture would still be, you know, public, but nobody really cares about the architecture itself. It's really the weights that we're trying to protect. Uh, so the weights could be encrypted. Uh, so you could protect the model itself. Uh, however, the problem is that if you want to encrypt a model uh, under the key of the company so that nobody can decrypt it, then you're, you're still going to have issues around processing the user data uh, some way. So either the user data is encrypted under the key of the company as well, but then you need to make sure the company cannot access the device of the user to decrypt it, right? Yeah. Or you need basically at least two parties to be able to collaborate with homomorphic encryption. So like a two key homomorphic encryption scheme uh, would enable you to encrypt the model with one key, process it under another key, and that would be fine. And then get the result back. So in some sense, so that's kind of, so that would allow you to be able to serve multiple customers with a single encrypted model on the cloud. So you could have multiple customers. Oh, no, you don't even need that. No, no, you don't need that. So, so the model itself, if you want to serve multiple customers, the model itself does not need to be encrypted. No, no, but it's supposed the model had to be encrypted as well. Oh. And this would be, but you could right. serve. Yes, then you would yeah. need that. Uh, okay. But th that would be, I mean, that's one way. Another way of doing it would be to maybe stick the model inside an HSM. Uh, and so that's a way for you to protect the model from the cloud infrastructure provider and still homomorphically process the user data. But like, you know, doing FHE inside, you know, an HSM is starting to be a little bit, uh, you know, well, I mean, why not, right? I mean, you've got FPGAs in HSMs now, so why not? It depends what the level of the HSM is. <laughs> we, can, we can do MPC within HSMs now, so why not? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so going back to GDPR, so what do you expect to happen um, in the regulated industry? So clearly, you know, this has huge application in highly regulated industries, finance, healthcare, da 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 da. But those are regulated; they have strong auditing uh, compliance um, regimes. How do you get these organizations or the, the, the people in those organizations which make these approvals uh, use FHE, you know, accept the use of FHE because it's a left field technology. Um, it's not on the usual list of tick boxes that your auditor or your compliance officer understands. So the technology part of a big corporation might understand what's going on, but the compliance part, which actually has to make the decision is going like, it's magic, we don't understand it. So how are, you, how are you going to get around those organizations in the highly regulated industries? Um, so, I mean, definitely standardization efforts. 
are going to help, uh, especially uh, standardization around, you know, what is considered to be secure parameters and how do you prove security and homomorphic encryption and so on and so forth. It always makes people feel more comfortable when they can see like a hundred page report that shows that, oh yeah, this works, right? At least this one we know works. Uh, but really, I think, you know, fundamentally, like most technologies, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you've got a hundred startups using FHE and none of them gets hacked, then, you know, your, your bank and your healthcare company might feel more comfortable using the technology because, well, you know, you've got a hundred early adopters before them, they use it successfully. Uh, so that's also why I think that, you know, th those huge industries, uh, precisely because of compliance risk, because of like, you know, uh, just, they just, they, they, if they mess up, the cost of it would be so huge they'd have no incentive to be early adopters, really, when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, they're definitely the, not the right people to address. You know, who you should be addressing are, you know, fast moving, kind of like edgy companies with really strong technical teams, you know, people who are used to adopting, you know, a V0.8 code libraries, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, shit, the, IPH, the API changed. That's fine. We're just going to work over it in a weekend. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, and so that's why, again, you know, I think that having more of a bottom-up open source approach uh, eventually gives you maybe more uh, traction with uh, people looking for those things, which are maybe more like, you know, big startups. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which themselves might be providers and suppliers to your, you know, big banks and whatever, which is also a way that you can, you know, step-by-step step work your way up to everything. Okay, so you mentioned standards there. So um, that leads on to my next question. What are there any standards going on? What's the standardization effort with FHE at the moment or HE? I should yeah. say, actually, to clarify, is that, is that FHE means you can compute any function. And when you say HE, it just means you can compute some function. Yeah. So, yeah, just well, to clarify. Although, although today, today we only talk about FHE. So I would say that when people say homomorphic encryption, they really mean fully homomorphic encryption. Um, so there is, you know, I, I guess the, the, one of the biggest standardization effort is called homomorphicencryption.org. Uh, so a bunch of companies are coming together and trying to basically agree on, you know, what's a standard. Uh, it's very hotly debated what ends up in that standard. Uh, you know, for example, one of the most widely uh, uh, used uh, homomorphic scheme called the CKKS uh, is technically not an FHE scheme because it only does approximate computation, but it's still being used in so many things, right? Where you are okay with approximate computation. So should it go into the standard or not go into the standard? You know, TFHE uses a completely different paradigm as, you know, some of the more traditional FHE techniques that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Oh, we don't really understand it as well. Um, so I think, you know, standardization can be done again, top down. Uh, or, you know, it can be bottom-up. It's uh, whatever gets adopted the widest is the standard, period. It's, um, uh, going back to business here, um, thank you for all your questions. Please keep them coming in. Um, so one person here asks, and I think this is more a general question, not just for FHE, is how as a company can you quantify return on investment for investing in privacy? Because basically, almost all companies that we know of make money out of not being private. Mm. So how can you differentiate, you know, how do you actually convince a company that actually processing your customer's data in a private way actually gives a direct return on investment and is not just a, a pretty thing to appeal to privacy nerds? So there is an answer right now, short term, and then there is the answer long term. Uh, Short term, I think that people are concerned around privacy for two reasons, uh, data breaches and surveillance resilience, right? If the data is encrypted, there is nothing to steal, whether it's from a government or from a hacker group, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing. Uh, the second thing is uh, it could be a competitive advantage, right? Uh, if you are the first company to offer a service with privacy, arguably, you know, there is, there is a niche of customers that want that already today, and when you look at the trends, people are asking for more privacy and data security, not less. Uh, I think also cloud companies have an opportunity in bringing back revenue to the cloud as a service, instead of having to do everything on-prem 
when customers are sensitive about data security. Because you know, if, if the customer sending you the data doesn't have to worry about you accessing the data, arguably they don't need you to do it on-prem anymore. So that's a short-term thing. Long-term, I don't think that this is the reason why companies will use it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that data localization has a huge cost uh, impact on uh, cloud computing cost because you need to pay for whatever resource is locally available. If you no longer have to worry about that, then it becomes an economical equation. Yeah, yeah. I'm using secure computation FHE and I don't have to basically use a European server. I can use a Chinese server and I'm saving you know, 90% of computing costs. I'm literally paying less money for my service. Yeah. And my reason is not privacy, it's not data security, it's lowering my cloud computing costs, which by the way, gives you as a collateral benefit, privacy and data security. Okay. Uh, and so, and so, you know, the, just one thing on top of that is I'm very convinced that 10 years in the future, there is going to be a new internet protocol, something, you know, beyond HTTPS for end-to-end -end encryption, right? So a server that is uh, compatible with, you know, end-to-end -end encryption, homomorphic encryption will have an HTTPZ, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, URL, for example, right? Uh, that would basically say, hey, you can send me homomorphically encrypted data, I'll homomorphically process it. And when that happens, then, you know, you've basically solved privacy on the web, pretty much. Although it did take 30 years for everyone to adopt SSL, it must be said. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think, I think it's going to take 10 years. Uh, 1994 to... Who do you need to motivate for that? <laughs> uh, who do you need to motivate to, to achieve that vision? Uh, who, you, well, there's a lot of people you need to motivate. Uh, to start with, you need to motivate uh, people who actually do write uh, those uh, internet protocols. Uh, and I think, you know, again, the best way of doing it is open source. Uh, you know, it's, uh, if everybody's already using it, making it a standard is not that much more complicated. Okay. The, um, uh, to, to one, yeah, okay, so one question is, we, we talked a lot about the future and, 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 and we're going like, oh, we could use this to do this, we could use this to do this. If I wanted, if I was going to deploy it now, what kind of technology, what kind of level of computation could I actually do, useful computation could I do now with FHE that I couldn't do in, with any other technique? So, you know, can I, can I, we've talked about a hundred level neural network. Is it possible for me as a company to run a hundred level neural network now? With Zama, yes. With Zama, okay. Is with it possible? Else, with, 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 any, with anything else, actually, if you wanted to do homomorphic inference, you would be limited to roughly, you know, 10 layers without activation, well, without precise activation functions. Okay. Uh, so we're the only scheme right now that supports arbitrary depth and arbitrarily complex uh, uh, activation functions. Okay. If I wanted to do processing a lot, suppose I was, everyone's doing their census at this time of the decade, yeah? So could I process, you know, the kind of statistics I need in the census homomorphically, which is basically really very simple descriptive statistics, sums, averages, standard deviations, and, and a few histograms. Is oh, that yeah. possible? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's like that's like that's like free. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. We do, yeah. So we're, we're just trying to see. So we have, and and so so people can get a view that, and and how big a data set. So there's an issue of the depth, but there's also the total amount of data. Can we cope with, you know? I don't know, 100 million, if we're doing the census of, I don't know, a, a, a large European country, which is at most 100 million, not even that. So yeah, that, that, that wouldn't be an issue because uh, uh, you, you wouldn't keep the data homomorphically encrypted at rest, right? No. Uh, because you can actually transcipher, uh, re-encrypt. So you can store the data uh, in whatever compact, AES, whatever format you want. And then you can deflate it into a homomorphic ciphertext to compute it, and then you know recompress it into AES or something when you store it. So in fact, really the only sort of bottleneck would be you know uh, compute time memory, but you would never compute on your entire data set homomorphically at once. You know either you're processing it you know sequentially, which is not an issue, or you're distributing it. Like I really don't see any use case, even training, you're not loading everything in memory, right? You're batching the inputs. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't foresee that to be a limitation in practice once the toolkits and the frameworks are available. And that's what this comes down to. 
The technology on paper enables these things to be solved. Nobody has implemented that at an application framework level, uh, which is one of the big challenges we have at Zama is making all of this useful in production and usable by someone who knows nothing about cryptography and who should never know nothing about cryptography, right? That's our job. Okay, so we're gonna end with one last question. Anyone that's asked questions in the chat, if you wanna stay on after we've stopped recording, we'll just quickly go through them and just answer them quickly because some of them are just like, yeah, yeah, they're quite easy to answer. Um, but the last question is, is, um, is from a policy perspective, is how can governments actually support privacy enhancing technologies, MPC, uh, FHG, zero knowledge? What could governments do to actually make the adoption of these technologies easier and faster? Uh, well, uh, include, uh, include this into the thinking around regulations, uh, right? So we, we talked about a GDPR, but it's not the only privacy regulation. There's like a, a zillion of them now. Uh, so that's the number one thing, right? Like uh, give credits for secure computational homomorphic encryption as solving some of the problems that were not solvable without strict regulations uh, previously. Uh, second thing is invest in companies building those things, which is already happening anyway, right? Uh, because I think like there's a lot of like budget around cryptography and cybersecurity that can go towards it. But still, we need a little bit more, you know, official endorsement of these things, just like DARPA is doing, for example, with, you know, the uh, hardware acceleration. Um, and yeah, and finally, just like help create awareness. I think, you know, it's, uh, uh, governments are really good at telling big companies uh, what they consider to be a good, safe alternative. And the sooner we can get governments to accept that secure computation, homomorphic encryption is a good way of processing your data privately, the faster adoption will happen. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. We'll end it there. As I said, if you want some of the other questions answered, just hang along. And we'll do a little wrap up at the end after we've finished recording. Um, I'd like to thank Rand. Brilliant. Well done. Cool. Round of applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. That's fine. Uh, thanks, Rob. And Jane, do you want to say something to end the session and whatever? Uh, by the way, I, I posted my email, my Twitter in the chat for everyone who wants to keep in touch, okay? Yeah, actually, yeah. What, like we did last week, please post stuff on Twitter afterwards. We will put, have put the recording on the Newton Gateway website. We will um, keep tweet tweeting, follow me, follow Rand on Twitter and you can have, keep, keep more updates. Cool, over to Jane. Thank you. I would also, um, thank you very, very much uh, Rand and um, also to you, Nigel and, and Rob as well. So thank you very much. Um, uh, just to say very quickly, um, I'm sure you've all seen our webpage. You'll see that the dates when the other three events are taking place. The next one is Tuesday the 8th of December on Zero Knowledge Proofs with Ellie Ban, Ben Sasson from Starkware and that's starting at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so and if you have any inquiries about the Gateway and the work that we do and you'd like to find out more or, or ask us about anything, please do get in touch. You should be able to find all our contact details on the web page. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you everybody. And please um, do let uh, Nigel know if you've got any more questions, he can deal with those now. Okay, thanks very much. Lizzie, thanks everyone. Talk. Thank you for-